just repeat after me. I'll just say the prayers word for word. Nama, Nama. Om, Om, Vishnu, Vishnu. Badaya, Badaya. Krishna, Krishna. Prastaya, Prastaya. Bhutale, Shimati, Siddha, Siddha. Swarup, Swarup. Ananda. Ananda, Para, Para. Mahamsa, Mahamsa. Ite, Ite. Namine. Namine. Baja, Baja. Shri, Shri, Krishna, Krishna. Chaitanya, Chaitanya. Prabhu, Prabhu. Nichananda, Shri, Shri, Advaita, Advaita. Gadadhar, Srivas, Ade, Ade. Gaur, Gaur. Bhakta, Bhakta. Vrindam, Hare, Hare Krishna, Krishna. Hare Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Rama Hare Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 So last week uh, we were discussing the uh, 10 principal teachings of the Vedas and uh, we went uh, through basically a brief explanation of the first teaching. Uh, so we'll just review that and then we'll move on into uh, Sambandha Jnana, which is the beginning of the seven middle teachings of the Vedas. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you guys, are you familiar with what the Vedas are? So the Vedas, you know, being the teachings yeah. that were compiled by uh, Srila Vyasadeva, written down, which came out of the place on the planet known as India. but which contain uh, eternal knowledge pertinent to all living beings regardless of what area they're born on, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so it's considered that of the Vedas which contain all this information for us, there's a, an essence or a cream of the Vedas and Garuda Das did such an amazing example the other night explaining of that, that process of the cream and he was say, talking about how when you milk a cow and the cream rises to the top and you have that layer of cream and it's so nice and tasty. And so it's like that, that the, the Srimad Bhagavatam rises to the top of the Vedas and it's the cream, it's the, the essence, the best, the tastiest part, the most relishable. And so this is the most important information of all the knowledge that was laid down or passed down to us. And the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Bhagavad Gita being included in that um, has these uh, 10 principal or important teachings uh, that are relevant to every living being and the first teaching of those ten teachings is the establishment of the authority of the Vedas so in other words if a person is reading that they may be going well why should I you know this is saying this but then I hear this and I hear that and there's so much knowledge out there so why should I listen to that or what in other words what's the authority behind that knowledge why should I invest my faith my time my energy into it you know so that's the, the groundwork is you got to establish the authority of what is it that why is a person qualified to speak or why is this information that's being written down qualified to be accepted as the truth. So we went uh, through that in great detail last week but in summary uh, essentially there are two types of receiving knowledge. Uh, one being the ascending method where you use your mind, your intelligence, your abilities to gather information digest it and uh, you learn something in that way you've gone through kind of trial and error and there's the descending method the descending method of receiving knowledge as it's been passed down um, and there are, so there are three ways in the descending process of verifying the knowledge of whether it's true because you could say okay well what if someone he or she tells me this and that you know it doesn't just mean it's true just because someone said it right so there's a verification system and that system is um, just like a table needs three legs to stand on so there's a, a system of three legs or three ways to check if something is true in the descending method and you can be assured that if all three things are in alignment then it can be accepted as true coming through parampara um, so we'll go over those three things briefly but the reason that the ascending process is uh, not uh, capable of or not accepted as a proper way of receiving the absolute truth is because it is reliant upon one's own body, senses, mind, and strength. 
and there are four basic defects or imperfections in all humans that uh, disqualifies this process of knowledge and makes, makes it so that it cannot be accepted as completely perfect, whereas the descending method is completely perfect in its, the way that it can preserve and pass down knowledge unchanged and with no ability of anyone uh, to tamper with or change that information because if they do then it, uh, it immediately becomes uh, impotent. In other words, the power that's being passed down through the descending process is like an electrical current and if someone is to take that information and change it, they immediately lose the, the current and so it becomes like a shadow of the real thing. Uh, so those four imperfections briefly are, uh, we have the propensity to commit mistakes, uh, we have the uh, propensity to fall into illusion, um, you know, you, you think it's one day, you think it's Friday, but it's actually Saturday, something like that, you know, just an example. The uh, propensity to, to cheat, to cheat ourselves and cheat others, you know, to get ahead the easy way. And uh, simply a limitation of our senses, you know, if I look out, I can only see a certain many miles away, I can't see 5,000 million miles in the distance. So we have all these limitations, so that's why it can be said that it's not quite uh, a perfect system, the ascending process of trying to use, and even if we get, even if I get a million people together, we all still have those limitations. So it's not like multiplying more people makes it more uh, perfect. Whereas with the descending process, it can be considered to be perfect because the knowledge is passed down unchanged and it's verified by the threefold method, which is guru or sadhu, which is the, the person who has uh, achieved spiritual enlightenment. And that person exhibits a certain uh, symptoms, which can be uh, thoroughly researched and checked through the other two methods. And then uh, if a person does in fact uh, have the, the primary symptom being the ability to transform someone else's heart from a lover of this world into a lover of God. They have this invisible potency that they carry with them. And so if a person is able to do that, then that's the primary symptom of guru or sadhu. But there are other symptoms as well. So this is our duty, as our utmost duty to research and find out what are these symptoms of the pure devotee. And that way we can know who is uh, sadhu or who is guru and who is not and then we check that with the other two which being uh, Shastra or scripture like Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam even uh, even other scriptures like the Puranas or the Holy Bible But you have to take into account you know that some texts like the Holy Bible have been changed You know over time there have been people that have gotten their hands on them and changed them for political means but if you take the essence of that you will find that it's all in alignment. So you have the scripture verifying the, the information, you have sadhu or saintly person, and then the third one, the most important one, especially at the beginning, is the paramatma, or the Lord in the heart. So we have God expanding himself out in our heart alongside our journey, and there to verify through our sincerity and through our prayer whether or not something is uh, real or whether or not it's, uh, you know, bogus. And so this is important uh, that we have to uh, be serious about turning to the Lord in the heart and saying, I need to know the truth. Can you verify to me what is the truth? You know, yes or no. And, it's, and there was a, an example that was given by uh, our Guru Dave quite a while ago that there was a woman who, uh, she said, oh, you know, I was, I was praying to God, you know, please, please reveal to me uh, that, that you're his representative, you know. And he said, this is, this is not right because uh, if you're asking God, please show me that this person is your representative. God will show you what you want to see. Rather, you should ask him, please show me whether or not. So that way you can determine whether or not rather, rather than show me just uh, just uh, what you basically what you want to project the answer to be you know what I mean be open to whether or not if that makes sense so he was saying that to to that uh, important question so we know that um, through these three things we can verify uh, that the information that's coming down is uh, 
is in fact bona fide, you know, is in fact uh, uh, spiritual and is uh, pertaining to uh, the absolute truth. And then from there we can begin to inquire and learn uh, Sambandha Jnana. So there are three after the uh, first teaching of the Veda which establishes the authority there is the Sambandha Jnana which is the next seven teachings and that's the most important to us as uh, individuals beginning our journey of self-realization and that's why it's fundamentally the, the majority of the teaching because we need to know who we are we need to know what is our position in relationship to this world and we need to know what is our eternal function you know we need to know who is God we need to know how we can get back to him so all of this information is contained there within the Sambandha Jnana and then you have uh, Abhideya Jnana, which is the process by which one, so once you know who you are, you know uh, where you're needing to go, then you need to know information about the process of how to get there. So that's Abhideya, and that involves the nine processes of devotional service. And then you have Prayojana Jnana, which is the last teaching, and that is information about the goal itself. In other words, the, the symptoms of Prema, Prema is like a spiritual substance that's exhibited in the pure state of the soul, which is pure unfiltered love for God, which is the, uh, the highest pleasure that the living entity is possible to experience. So that's, that's what we're going for here with this process of Bhakti Yoga, where we're heading to achieve Prema, which is the platform of love for God. When we reawaken this state, we're tasting Prema, 24 hours a day, we've achieved samadhi, which is trance, which is the goal of the Ashtanga yoga system as well. But it's much faster with the bhakti system. We can go straight to samadhi without having to do all the austerities and the, the different yama, niyama observances, things like that. Now, there, those things are still helpful for the bhakta, for the bhakti yogi. You know, if he's really serious, he can cut certain things out of his life and add certain things to really facilitate his development of prema faster. But if he simply hears in chants and abandons everything else and focuses on that, he will reach perfection gradually and the other things will fall away. And so this is our great assurance. This is uh, why we have come into contact with the greatest gem because all we have to do is hold on to the holy names and we're guaranteed success. It's just a matter of not letting the mind drag you away from the holy names and it will from time to time and even great great individuals um, have fallen away for some time due to different uh, either offenses that they've committed or uh, Maya's influence being strong in the mind or their heart being somewhat weak or then being a pacifist inside themselves and not defending their spiritual master or defending Krishna against the onslaught of Maya so basically, two things, you know, maya and one's own offenses. And, uh, but many of those individuals have eventually come back around and regained their, their uh, spiritual vigor. And, uh, you know, Krishna states in the Bhagavad Gita that any progress that you make in this lifetime is never lost. So you, you take it right back up. You're given the chance again next time around. You can start right back up. So that's why... It's such a wonderful uh, system and a wonderful opportunity because, you know, anything else, it's not gonna not gonna really matter. If I if I become a CEO of a bank and I stockpile, you know, 8.7 billion dollars, and then I'm thinking I've achieved something great and I party for the rest of my life, you know, and enjoy, then at the time of death, I lose it all. <laughs> it's like it's gone, you know. It was just a waste. But with this stuff. You get to take it with you. So even if you make some progress and then you fall off and then you make the 8 billion, the next time around you're going to lose the 8 billion but you still retain your spiritual progress. So that's how much Krishna loves us, you know, that he's, uh, he's looking out for us in that way. So um, we're going to just go into the basic uh, teaching here, which is on chapter 2, text 20. This is one of my favorite texts. And this is the beginning of the Abhideya Yana. Om 
Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. It says, Na Jayate Mriyate Vakarachin, Nayambutwa Bhavita Banabuyaha, Ajo Nijaha Saswato Yampurano, Nahanyate Hanyamane Sarive. Translation is, For the soul, there is never birth nor death, nor having once been, does he ever cease to be. He is unborn, eternal, ever existing, undying, and primeval. He is not slain when the body is slain. So this is pretty fascinating because it says that uh, the soul never came into being and he never ceases existing. So in other words, it's a perpetual existence. So it does in other chapters talk about um, when the soul moves into the unmanifest. In other words, it can temporarily move into a state uh, where it is simply merged into an ocean of consciousness or energy, like kind of like a, a seed that's waiting to come back into existence. But it never stops existing. So that's that's the, the closest thing to to death would be would be this state of uh, unmanifest, you know, which can happen, you know, at the end of the dissolution of the universe. If one hasn't made enough spiritual progress to go back to the spiritual world, then this may happen. We may move into this state of unmanifest for a time, but then we're going to come back and exist again. So we have to understand that these bodies are just temporary vehicles, you know. We've been moving through many bodies, and now we're in this one, and you know, it's just a, it's just a phase, you know. It's not a, it's not something that we should get overwhelmed by, or make a priority. And that's you've got to understand that that's the, uh, the big problem that's causing so many problems with the world is that people are making the body that they're inhabiting their number one priority. So you, have, you see what the consciousness is, they, they prioritize the priority of their life is around the body. And so as spiritual aspirants, our goal is to try to make the priority of our life about the spirit soul instead of the body. So this takes time, you know, but we have to understand that I'm a living entity, so my priority should be my spiritual benefit, not my benefit of the body. And we still take care of the body, but we put the spiritual benefit first and foremost just like coming to kirtan this is very helpful it's like taking a shower on the inside you know so if we keep doing this then uh good things are coming <laughs> uh so let me read bhaktivedanta swami's purport here he says qualitatively the small atomic fragmental part of the supreme spirit is one with the supreme he undergoes no changes like the body sometimes the soul is called the steady or kutashta. The body is subject to six kinds of transformations. It takes birth in the womb of the mother's body, remains for some time, grows, produces some effect, gradually dwindles, and at last vanishes into oblivion. The soul, however, does not go through such changes. The soul is not born, but because he takes on a material body, the body takes its birth. The soul does not take birth there, and the soul does not die. Anything which has birth also has death, and because the soul has no birth, he therefore has no past, present, or future. He is eternal, ever-existing, and primeval. That is, there is no trace in history of his coming into being. Under the impression of the body, we seek the history of birth, etc., of the soul. The soul does not at any time become old as the body does. The so-called old man, therefore, feels himself to be in the same spirit as his childhood or youth. The changes of the body do not affect the soul. The soul does not deteriorate like a tree, nor anything material. The soul has no byproduct either. The byproducts of the body, namely children, are also different individual souls, and owing to the body they appear as children of a particular man. The body develops because of the soul's presence, but the soul has neither offshoots nor change. Therefore, the soul is free from the six changes of the body. In the Kata Upanishad, also we find a similar passage which reads, Najayate mriyate va vipaschin, nayam kutaschin, na vibhuva kaschit, ajo nitya hashashwato yam purano, na hanyate hanyamene sarede. And the meaning and purport of this verse is the same as in Bhagavad Gita, but here in this verse there is one special word, vipaschit, which means learned or with knowledge. 
The soul is full of knowledge, or full always with consciousness. Therefore, consciousness is the symptom of the soul. Even if one does not find the soul within the heart where he is situated, one can still understand the presence of the soul simply by the presence of consciousness. Sometimes we do not find the sun in the sky owing to clouds or for some other reason, but the light of the sun is always there, and we are convinced that it is therefore daytime. As soon as there is a little light in the sky early in the morning, we can understand that the sun is in the sky. Similarly, since there is some consciousness in all bodies, whether man or animal, we can understand the presence of the soul. The consciousness of the soul is, however, different from the consciousness of the Supreme, because the Supreme Consciousness is all knowledge, past, present, and future. The consciousness of the individual soul is prone to be forgetful. When he is forgetful of his real nature, he obtains education and enlightenment from the superior lessons of Krishna. But Krishna is not like the forgetful soul. If so, Krishna's teaching of Bhagavad Gita would be useless. There are two kinds of souls, namely the minute particle soul, Anu Atma, and the super soul, Vibhu Atma. This is also confirmed in Kata Upanishad in this way. Anor Anyan Mahato Mahayan Atmasya Jantor Nihito Gohayam Tam Akratuhu Pashati Vita Shoko Datuhu Prashadan Mahi Manam Atmanaha Both the Super Soul Paramatma and the Atomic Soul Jivatma are situated on the same tree of the body within the same heart of the living being. And only one who has become free from all material desires as well as lamentations can by the grace of the Supreme understand the glories of the soul. Krishna is the fountainhead of the super soul also as will be disclosed in the following chapters and Arjuna is the atomic soul forgetful of his real nature therefore he requires to be enlightened by Krishna or by his bona fide representative the spiritual master. So one thing that stood out to me this there was when he said that only one who has become free from all material desires as well as lamentations can, by the grace of the Supreme, understand the glories of the soul. So, just like we're discussing a little bit about the qualities of the soul, the glories are actually so vast and so innumerable that if we could really comprehend them, it would just be so wonderful. And Krishna is saying here that someday we can come to this point where we're actually understanding the glory of our own soul, of who we really are. So we've kind of forgotten who we are, but if we knew how awesome we were, so he's saying, someday we're going to be able to know how glory, uh, the glory that we really have, you know, inherently. This is really nice. Mm -hmm. um, so that's so that's it for, for this lesson. This is the beginning, is the essence of us is spiritual, you know, which we hear again and again, but to really understand it is like, yeah. So it's something that we need to continually hear until we experience it by through revelation until we're living it till we're living the i am not the body i am a spiritual being so until that happens we can keep hearing it and even after you're living it it's still nice to hear it because it's, it reminds you of uh you know your relationship with god and it's it's greatly relishable by liberated souls as the word would say um so next week we'll talk about our position which is the next uh, step of Sambandhyana. And then the week after we'll go into function. So I hope you guys can join us next Monday. And then uh, let's just finish with a little bit of kirtan. So do some more chanting. Is that okay? Or... You, you can uh, 